Good evening, and welcome back to Dead Sleep, the Goldilocks of true crime podcasts. The very best true crime classics told for bedtime. Not too loud, not too long, just right. I'm Nancy Miller, your narrator and the creator of Dead Sleep, and thank you for listening and supporting this podcast. If you like the show, support my work by becoming a subscriber through Apple Podcasts. But don't worry about that right now. You can do it in the morning. Right now, it's time for the fourth and final installment of Fatal Vision. And what happens in Fatal Vision and in the saga of Dr. Jeff McDonald, it's exhausting. And I guess exhausting is the point of dead sleep. So let's get comfortable, settle in for the night, get cozy under the covers, close your eyes, and get ready to fall dead asleep as we find out what happens next in the murder trial against Jeff McDonald, where a jury will have to decide once and for all, could a man like him do a thing like that? Raleigh. North Carolina, 1979. It was a hot and humid August night. Temperatures in the 90s with 90% humidity. The kind of night and the kind of heat where you just wanted to stay still, sprawled out on a bed with one single crisp linen sheet. The only movement, the whirl of a rotating fan. lulling you to sleep. But Dr. Jeff McDonald wasn't like most people. When things got too hot, too uncomfortable, too sticky, he didn't stay still. He ran. Five miles around the track of a local college campus. In late August 1979, Jeff ran like his life depended on it, because tomorrow he would testify. And his testimony would essentially determine if he was going to be a free man or if he was going to spend the rest of his life in prison. Jeff ran back to his defense team's headquarters, a Kappa Alpha house, a fraternity house, on the college campus of North Carolina State that was mostly empty for the summer. Jeff's legal team arranged to rent the house for the duration of the trial, which meant Jeff, his mom, Jeff's large legal team were all roommates, living and working together day in and day out. And then, of course, there was Joe, the journalist. He was ensconced in that frat house, too. Jeff and Joe jogged together, drank beer together, watched Saturday Night Live together, talked about women together. And Joe was included in every single meeting Jeff had with his defense team, scribbling down every detail in his notebook. The meeting they had on this late August night was about how Jeff was going to tell his story. How his version of events of what happened that night, the early hours of February 17th, 1970. When four intruders broke into the family home, three men wielding a wood club, a knife, and an ice pick, and that one woman in a floppy hat who held a candle to her face and talked about acid being groovy and killing the pigs. How Jeff tried to fight back, wrapping his torn blue pajama top around his wrists to protect himself from one of the men who was coming at him with an ice pick. How he was knocked unconscious. How he awoke and ran around the house trying to save his wife and children. How he called the authorities twice for help before collapsing into a crumpled heap next to the body of his beloved wife. Since 1970, Jeff had told a variation of this story many times. First to army investigators, then in front of Colonel Rock at that military hearing, then in front of millions of people on a late night talk show, and later in front of a federal grand jury, the one that decided to indict him. Tomorrow, Jeff would take the stand and tell his story about what happened that night one last time. 
Jeff's longtime lawyer, Bernie Siegel, was there to make sure the jury was on Jeff's side. When Jeff and Bernie met, Jeff was 26 and Bernie was 38. Jeff was now close to 40. A Robert Redford 40. At least that's how Jeff liked to think of himself. Bernie was pushing 50. Definitely still Richard Dreyfus, just less close encounters and more Mr. Holland's opus. Time had passed, yes. But Bernie's belief in Jeff's case was the same. Jeff was innocent. He didn't do this. This would be the last time Bernie defended Jeff in court. Enough was enough. That wasn't just how Bernie felt. That was his defense strategy. Jeff had suffered enough. Wasn't it time to bring this man some peace? To ensure this was the last trial for Jeff, Bernie left nothing to chance, not even himself. Bernie was always an odd fit for Jeff's military murder case. An outsider, a liberal Jewish lawyer from Philly who dressed in flashy suits and puffed cigars. He needed a ringer, a local. He brought in 42-year-old lawyer Wade Smith to assist. A former football player for UNC and a highly respected criminal attorney in his own right. Bernie called Wade his golden boy. Bernie also brought with him a squad of young, attractive female legal assistants. They were there to make Bernie more appealing, less prickly, like placing sprigs of baby's breath around a paddle cactus. It appeared to be working. From the very first opening argument, the jury connected with Wade, Bernie's golden boy who explained in his warm Southern drawl how Jeff McDonald was the victim of gross negligence and legal malfeasance. Not only had he lost his family, he'd endured years of torment from a corrupt and incompetent legal system. And still, ladies and gentlemen, Jeff rose above it all to become a decent, hardworking, intelligent, and good doctor. Enough was enough. What made Bernie even more confident was when he found out who the lead prosecutor was. Well, actually, who the lead prosecutor wasn't. The man who should have been there arguing the case against Jeff was a top Justice Department attorney with years of experience. That attorney died. He'd suffered a fatal heart attack on his way to the corner store to buy a bottle of hot sauce. Which meant it was baptism by fire for his replacement. The lead prosecutor was now an assistant U.S. attorney named Jim Blackburn. Jim was 34, Southern and soft-spoken, and had never argued a murder case before. Which meant Jeff McDonald's murder trial, the most high-profile triple murder case in North Carolina history, was going to be his first. Jim's co-prosecutor was his only hope, Brian Murtaugh, a young, nerdy military attorney who'd worked this case against Jeff since 1971. Brian was Bernie's nemesis. Bernie and Jeff despised Brian so much, they nicknamed him the Viper. In the beginning, Jim and the Viper were off to a shaky start. You'll remember, from that first morning of the murders way back in February of 1970, the weakness in this case came down to those first few hours, where inexperienced military police led a parade through the crime scene. Key evidence was lost, stolen, or thrown away. Nine and a half years and two investigations later, Prosecutors seemed so determined to prove to Bernie, and to themselves, that they had solid physical evidence against Jeff, they almost forgot their audience, the jury, as prosecutors went into every single microscopic detail about pajama tops and the number of holes in the pajama tops and the shape of the holes in the pajama tops and the blue threads found here but not there, blood patterns and blood phenotypes, 
the jury sat as alert and attentive as twelve Labrador retrievers. But it was too overwhelming to take it all in. Bernie knew his audience. The jury didn't want to convict Jeff. They wanted to sympathize with him. They needed the story. The story Jeff had to perform one last time with feeling. Feelings like sadness, grief, weren't easy for Jeff. Like it or not, at this point, Colette and the girls, the actual victims, were distant abstractions. His testimony was now about protecting himself, his freedom, not his family. And that made Jeff angry. Bernie warned Jeff that if that anger came out in front of the jury, it was over. When Jeff's big day in court finally arrived, he told his story for over five hours, with old pictures of him with his happy family as his backdrop. He broke down as if it happened yesterday. Everyone in the courtroom was moved, many of them to tears. Except for Freddie Kassab, who sat in the front row on the prosecution side, of course. As Jeff sobbed, Freddie shouted, Faker! loud enough for the whole courtroom to hear. Freddie and Mildred hadn't seen their ex son in law in over eight years. When they saw him in court, they didn't speak to Jeff. They didn't need to. Freddie said it all in an interview with People magazine when he told a reporter that if the legal system failed him again, he'd take matters into his own hands. Freddie was 62 years old with early signs of emphysema, but Bernie knew Freddie was serious. He bought Jeff a bulletproof vest for when the jury announced not guilty, just to be safe. But they weren't at the not guilty verdict, not yet. The prosecution's strategy was straightforward. Jeff had told his story about what happened that night, the day before. Now it was their turn to ask Jeff to fill in the holes. The story was so compelling, but there were so many things that just didn't make sense. It was a hard question to ask, but it was obvious. Why was Jeff alive and his family dead? In front of the jury, Jeff did exactly what he wasn't supposed to. He became angry, his answers sarcastic. He rolled his eyes at Jim. He argued, he sounded defensive, and well, he sounded like he was lying. But remember, Bernie was leaving nothing to chance. He had one last trick up his sleeve. A mystery witness. Someone who'd saved Jeff before. And she could save him again. Helena Stokely. No one, not even her own mother, knew where Helena was. But Helena's mother was clear with Bernie. Her daughter had nothing to do with these murders. She was a vulnerable young girl that the detective, the one she called Daddy, had planted this idea in her head that she was part of it somehow and just couldn't remember. This unknowing had traumatized Helena ever since. Her mother warned Bernie, if you find Helena, she'll talk. She'll always talk. But what she says will be nonsense. Investigators proved years ago that she'd never been near the McDonald home but that didn't matter. If Bernie could just get her to confess, as she'd done so many times before, that was it. Reasonable doubt, Jeff would go free. On that August morning in 1979, when Helena Stokely walked into the federal building for her witness interview with Bernie and his legal team, she wasn't the twitchy, terrified, sponge brain junkie he might have hoped for. She was dressed neatly and demurely in a floral print dress, in as impenetrable as a slab of sandstone. Bernie tried everything to get her to confess. He put pictures of the crime scene in front of her. He sweet talked her. When that didn't work, he yelled at her Confess, goddammit. Confess. Helena just sat 
and sipped a can of diet soda and said, flatly, I can't help you. I wasn't in that house. I didn't have anything to do with this. Helena wasn't going to save Jeff. Not this time. Which meant the key to Jeff's verdict came down to the very last day of the trial. The closing arguments. Those final crucial takeaway thoughts for the jury to remember before they deliberated. Bernie, who knew this case better than anyone, would take jurors through Jeff's case for two hours. Then, the golden boy Wade was supposed to take that last hour and 15 minutes to bring it on home. But that's not what happened. After all of the things that he told Jeff, all of the steps he'd taken to make this case foolproof, Bernie went off script and unleashed a decade of pent-up rage about the investigation, the U.S. military, the judicial system, all of it, in an incoherent tirade that went on for over three hours. Mercifully, when the judge tapped his pencil to let Bernie know his time was almost up, he turned to Wade, the golden boy, who had barely a few minutes to try and save Jeff McDonald's life. But there wasn't much he could do. The jury deliberated. Six and a half hours later, they came back with their verdict. We didn't want to convict him, one juror later said. Maybe if we'd heard from Wade Smith, that Southern lawyer, just a little bit longer, we could have gone the other way. But they didn't. Jeff was found guilty on all three counts of murder. Amidst all of the slow motion courtroom chaos, sat Freddie and Mildred Casal. They watched as the man who killed their daughter and granddaughters was taken away. They watched him get smaller and smaller and farther and farther away until he disappeared behind a door and out of their lives forever. A very stunned Jeff McDonald was taken into custody. He was strip searched, his belongings taken, his freedom snatched away. But there was something they couldn't take away from him. His book with Joe McGinnis. Joe's book would sway public opinion, could get Jeff a new trial, maybe even a presidential pardon. In a few days, Jeff would get on a bus and be driven across the country to a prison off of the coast of Southern California called Terminal Island. It sounded like something out of the Count of Monte Cristo. Jeff quickly dashed off a letter to Joe, the journalist who was also, he believed, one of his closest friends. Joe would tell the story of Jeff McDonald, an innocent man caught up in the combine of the criminal justice system. Joe McGinnis sat in Jeff's condo in Huntington Beach. It was a few months after the verdict. Jeff's condo had floor-to-ceiling mirrors in nearly every room. Joe could see every side of himself at every angle. Joe was in his mid-30s, handsome in that New England rumpled preppy way with the pale Irish complexion that didn't agree with the California sun. Even with all of those mirrors, Joe couldn't see his most crucial angle. Who was Jeff McDonald? Was he a deeply disturbed murderer or a very unlucky innocent man? Back in Raleigh, Joe and Jeff broke down. Joe kept waiting for the mask to drop just for a moment, but Jeff didn't have a mask. But if he'd done it, which the jury believed he did, how did Joe not see the murderer? Joe, as a journalist, liked to think he was on the side of truth. But what that truth was, he didn't yet know. He temporarily moved into Jeff's Huntington Beach condo. With Jeff's blessing, there were boxes and boxes of case files. Go ahead and dig through them, Jeff said. Have at it. Which had to mean Jeff was innocent. As Joe dug in, to his surprise, he found a document at the bottom of one box... When Joe looked at the document, he was shocked. Nobody, not the police or lawyers or anyone, 
had mentioned it. After accusing acid-crazed homicidal hippies of killing his family for over nine years, there really was a drug-fueled killer. It was Jeff McDonald. It turned out Jeff McDonald was taking diet pills. These particular diet pills were a mix of amphetamines and other chemicals that were reportedly the cause of psychosis. Joe theorized if Jeff, a young army doctor, was already exhausted from working long hours, and was also tweaked out on these diet pills, was it possible Jeff lost control and did what he did? Maybe it was a stretch, but it was enough to get Joe thinking. There was this moment, back at the trial in North Carolina, that Joe couldn't get out of his mind. Joe's notebooks were filled with moments of Jeff being angry. Angry at the Army, at the lawyers, at the Justice Department, at the judge, anyone who'd wronged Jeff. He waged war against them. But during the trial, when Helena was barely 10 feet from him, Jeff didn't react at all. Here was the woman who'd supposedly killed his family, or at least had a role in it. And yet, Joe watched Jeff's reaction. Nothing. Over the next year, Joe interviewed Freddie and Mildred Kassab. He interviewed all the investigators. He went to the McDonald home when the murders happened. The scale of Joe McGinnis's reporting for this book was incredible. The truth, as Joe saw it, was devastating. Joe was going to tell the real truth about Dr. Jeff McDonald. And to do that, Joe revealed his darker side. Joe was going to play a dangerous game, but he saw it as a noble deception. Joe now knew Jeff was the murderer, but he continued to communicate with Jeff as if he believed he were innocent to keep up that relationship, keep up that trust, all for the truth. Which sounded like a fine idea while Jeff was in prison. In another wild court ruling that's just too much to get into, Jeff was released from prison. His conviction in the three murders vacated. Joe was back on the East Coast now, secretly working away on a book that was basically Jeff is a psycho killer. All while Jeff thought they were friends. At one point, Joe reluctantly visited Jeff in Huntington Beach. With everything he believed about Jeff now, everything the guy did seemed like the moves of a cold-blooded psychopath. Even at a barbecue, Joe watched in horror as Jeff went into the kitchen and sharpened a set of dull knives. Jeff's freedom lasted 18 months. Then, another court decision reinstated his conviction. Jeff went back to prison. And Joe, the journalist, kept up the charade. The book took four years. When Fatal Vision was finally published in 1983, It was nearly 700 pages of how Dr. Jeff McDonald was a murderer, as well as a creep, a cheater, a master manipulator, narcissist, a psychopath, a latent homosexual, and just an all-around total dick. Fatal Vision was a blockbuster, a huge bestseller. Joe McGinnis was back on top. Meanwhile, rotting in a dank prison cell for the rest of his life, Jeff McDonald. So, happily ever after? Not quite. If Joe thought he was safe from Jeff because he was in prison, Joe was dead wrong. In 1984, Jeff filed a lawsuit against Joe McGinnis, suing him for fraud. And because of some penciled-in detail Bernie, his lawyer, had written into their book contract, Jeff was able to make his case against Joe go to court. In 1987, Jeff and Joe 
were in court together again. Only this time, Joe was the defendant and Jeff his accuser. Jeff was a convicted murderer, but his fraud case against Joe was more about the nature of their relationship. He and Joe had a book contract together. They were almost like business partners, and Joe had betrayed him completely. In Jeff's opinion, no journalist should be allowed to do that. He was going to make an example of Joe. He was going to make Joe pay. The evidence against Joe were all those letters, and there were a lot of them. It wasn't just the obsequious tone of these letters. Over and over again, Joe ensured that Jeff kept cooperating with him, even though he knew he was going to write a book that condemned Jeff McDonald. And he kept all of this a secret. Jeff had no idea until the book came out. The jury actually felt sorry for Jeff. Who was the real psychopath here, they wondered. The murderer or the journalist? The trial ended in a hung jury. And it might surprise you that nearly all of the jurors, five out of six, were in favor of Jeff McDonald. The case was ultimately settled out of court for a ridiculous amount of money. Joe McGinnis refused to admit any wrongdoing. But his entanglement with Jeff and the embarrassing lawsuit damaged Joe's career for decades. It was Joe, not Jeff, whose ethics were brutally criticized by a famous New Yorker writer named Janet Malcolm, whose book, The Journalist and the Murderer, would become more famous than Fatal Vision itself. Then in 2012, legendary documentarian Errol Morris would again take Joe to task for his reporting on Fatal Vision and suggest, once again, that Jeff was indeed the victim. In response, Joe published Final Vision, basically an F y'all to his critics before Joe died in 2014 at the age of 71. Jeff is still alive, but nearly everyone else has passed on. Well, except for two really important people. Prosecutors Jim Blackburn and Brian the Viper Murtaugh. The Viper actually went on to have a huge career. He was the lead U.S. prosecutor on another epic case, the 1988 Lockerbie bombing trial. For 40 years, though, right up until Jeff's last appeal was denied in 2018, Brian the Viper was always there in court ready to strike Jeff down. Oh, and there is one last twist. Fatal Vision sold millions of copies, and it would have made Jeff a very wealthy man, except Freddie and Mildred Kassab sued to take that money. And in the end, they won. Thank you for listening to Dead Sleep, True Crime for Bedtime. And if you have the opportunity, I highly recommend reading or listening to The Real Fatal Vision by Joe McGinnis. It's absolutely worth your time, and I feel like I barely scratched the surface. I'll be back in December with more true crime stories made for bedtime, including bonus episodes and Dead Sleep mixtapes for subscribers. Until then... Nighty-night.